what an honor to have uh, finally Ward Cunningham with us. Uh, you know, I, I I tweeted the other day saying this is for me a, a dream come true to have Ward Cunningham finally uh, speak at Agile India. Uh, Ward has been someone who has deeply, deeply influenced uh, you know my thinking. Uh, so this is this is such an honor to to have uh, him present and uh, hear from him. Uh, for folks who who may not be aware of uh, all the awesome work that Ward has done, let me, uh, I, I won't be able to do justice to it, honestly, uh, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. I will, I will try. Uh, for me, the, 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 when I think of Ward, uh, the, the first thing that comes to my mind, of course, is extreme programming. I think you've been extremely influential in the extreme programming. That's my first uh, exposure uh, to your great work. And of course, later I, I realized that you were the uh, you know the, one of the key players behind object orientation, design patterns. You brought Alexander's book, uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, you and Kent uh, had discussions around patterns, and then popularized that to a broader community. So the whole thinking around patterns, uh, design patterns. Uh, I think uh, what has to be the person who gets credit for that. And uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, wikis, I mean, how can I forget wiki? Uh, <laughs> such, a, such a revolution in terms of, uh, I, I think people credit you to be the man behind web 2.0 uh, and, uh, you know, Wikipedia, encyclopedia, everything that's kind of grown out of it. Uh, what a fantastic way to, uh, you know, basically uh, bring people together and get them to collaborate at, at, at a global scale. Uh, so again, uh, and of course, uh, you know, fit, which was uh, your original thought process. Uh, and for me, executable specification, you know, when I saw fit, it was like, ah, this makes sense. Like this is, this yeah. is absolutely what it is. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ward, such, a, such an amazing uh, amount of uh, contributions. And of course, now in your daytime job, you're at uh, New Relic, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and again, doing some awesome work. Uh, you guys, folks at New Relic are, are really helping uh, lots of companies. So it's, it's amazing. Uh, so again, uh, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, you know, appreciate uh, everything that you've done, Ward, and thanks for coming, joining us today. It is a pleasure to uh, have this uh, chance to talk and, and uh, the fact that it's going all the way around the world is pretty neat too. You know, I like that. And, uh, and I didn't have to get on an airplane to do it. So thank you very much for remembering me and inviting me this time. So it's, uh, it's pretty sweet. Uh, I, uh, I've done a lot of talks. Uh, I've been working on this wiki thing, Federated Wiki for, for a number of years, and I have an awful lot of content and that's a few things I want to demo. So I'm just going to start in it. And, and I, I want to show you that this, this stuff is all available to you. This is a site called ward.fed.wiki. Three very important things there. And if I go here, I end up at this site. Featured pages. This is a talk I did last week, and this is what I'm doing right now. And so this is, this is where my talk will be. And then we'll, we'll, we'll zoom to the right and get a little further into this uh, as we go along. But... Uh, Here's a little conversation we had. I like to have the conversation that we had about what we're going to do so that while I'm working up the talk, I'm looking at it and say, can I deliver on what I promised? And I hope so. The, uh, uh, the thing that, that, that I can do that uh, a lot of other people are actually much better at Agile than I am because they've explored so many ways to apply it to so many different things. Uh, but uh, I, was there, I was there when there was only a few of us and I like to think about what we were thinking when we were uh, looking for a new way uh, to think about programming. And of course, it's, it's no accident that computers were changing dramatically. This was the dawn of the desktop era. But I'd like to think more about learning about what computers do, or I like to think what computers want to do versus what, what you want them to do. And, and, and that, you get into a loop and, and that learning loop is really important. So, so in, in some of my notes, I call this the age of agile versus the age of other things. 
and, and I want to just look at, at, at uh, three of them, because if we take each one apart and say, how does the learning happen? How do we get better for having this? Then we won't forget that that stuff doesn't go away. You know, there's lots of ways to get better at things and so forth. Uh, this kind of answers the question as, are we done with Agile or not? And of course, we're not done with Agile. Uh, we're, we're not even done with the read of Al print loop. And, and, and you may not realize there was a time where there wasn't a read of Al print loop. There, uh, computer programs could read interactively from a teletype or something and could print something. And, and it was the read process write loop or input process output, they would call it. And the processing is what the computer did. And it was fixed. It did what it was programmed to do. But it was really kind of while I was in college even that, that people got good enough at compiling a language or understanding statements, evaluating the, the process step became an eval step where you could sit at a terminal and type an expression and hit carriage return. And that computer would do something it had never done before. It would evaluate your expression. And, and of course, you'd usually say syntax error or something like that. And then you say, okay, let me just try another time and another time. And that read of Al print loop, well, you know, it, it really started, the list people got it, you know, before anybody else, because it was so easy to parse their language because of all those parentheses, but it was also a powerful language. So people would sit at that and have a conversation with the computer and you know, teach it to do a few things and then have a conversation a little higher level and so forth. That, that read eval print loop was fabulous. And, and uh, you know, the fact that it might take two seconds to compile and execute, you, you were ready to wait those two seconds because two seconds isn't very long to wait. Uh, and notice that it hasn't gone away. You know, I, I am in a read eval print loop pretty much all day long every day. And it might be in the, the JavaScript uh, uh, inspector or something uh, trying out, does this, does this crazy, you know, JavaScript command really do what I think it does? Or, or, uh, or, or Unix, the Unix command line is the classic, you know, and, and, you know, that goes back to the 70s or something. And who would have thought that it lasts that long? But, uh, you know, to, to type something into that read of L print loop and get a result and compose up the next thing is, is magical. Now, that changed. I mean, as powerful as that is, it wasn't enough to handle uh, the desktop. And with the desktop was a graphics display and the, the mouse or pointing device or whatever. All of that just changed the way we thought about interacting with a computer. And it was not an easy transformation. The programming style changed and so forth. But more importantly, uh, you know, people could buy those computers and they'd put them on their desk and say, I could do my work with this computer if this computer were only a little smarter. And then they pulled together a team of people to make it smarter. And it would be, we called it the, uh, developers and the customer, you know, it wasn't really, I mean, it was the person who got the authorization to have your time to work on their problem. And so they own the problem and we own the solution and we just had to get it to, to go together. And the, the most important thing that happened there is that we could take a guess about what they were wanting, show it to them a week later, and they'd say, oh my God, that is so close, but you have to do this and this and this too. And, and that, that iterative thing and, and to do it in a week. I mean, you know, going from a few seconds to a week is actually a big, but, but it was magical what you could put on a screen and people would just poke at and kind of figure out what they thought they wanted isn't what they thought they wanted what they wanted but what they wanted is something like you showed them only a little better and that that iterative loop was at the heart of uh, extreme programming uh, a lot of people thought we were crazy because we you can't you can't jump in and start writing code until you understand the whole problem 
Well, nobody understood the whole problem. So we understood a little bit of the problem and then we had a little more and so forth. And, and I don't think uh, there's anybody that doesn't understand that now, but that was, uh, that was revolutionary. And, and, and it was, I mean, we like to think that we were all brilliant, but it was really just the desktop demanded it. When the desktop showed up, we had to do it. And uh, so I wanna talk a little more about that in a minute because of what I thought were the most important ideas. But I'd like to finish this idea of thinking about how technology progresses and, and drags us along. And the, uh, the thing, and, and I don't know how many people are doing this, but the, the big data center and the software as a service uh, uh, sign up a million users and serve them all at once out of the you know, data centers around the world. All this stuff is, is fabulously complex. If, if from time sharing to desktop was a big step, from desktop to software as a service is an even bigger step. And I think there's a lot, a lot of people that are still kind of figuring out how to do that and be relaxed about it. So, uh, and I think what's really going on there when I talk to people, of course, they're still using the, the they call it the REPL now, the read of L print loop, REPL every day, iterative development every day, and, incidents, hopefully not every day, but you know, you don't go very many days until something goes wrong that you simply can't explain. That it, it's something that you've never seen before. You may never see again, but you have to figure out what it is to get the, you know, the, the, the application running again. And this, uh, I'll call it the incident recovery loop. Something goes wrong, people have to fix it in the moment, when it's fixed, then you have to go back and say, how do we prevent that from ever happening again? And, and what were the details of that? And why did we make the decisions we did in the 10 minutes that we were trying to fix it that in retrospect, you know, maybe wasn't the best decisions to make, but it was what happened. And that kind of analysis after the fact in an incident. And this is just because of the nature of the thing. When you get hundreds or thousands of computers working together, you know, everything's kind of a little failing here and there and, and that, you know, and, and, and you can't, you can't, I mean, things are better reboot themselves. You can't be out there rebooting everything because, you know, it just has to take care of itself. But when it's taking care of itself, it's, it's all these system things start interacting in ways that can't be anticipated. So, um, um, yeah, yeah. I wish, I wish I were a genius about that. You know, I've always liked to get the computer to tell me what it's doing and, and, and that helps. We call that observability now, but the, uh, the, the, the real thing is how do you organize your stuff, your code, your teams, your company, so that when the completely unexpected thing happens that you can move ahead orderly and muster the resources and so forth. And, and I looked to this guy, David Woods, and, and his, his cohort, John Allspa, uh, Richard Cook are, are names. And, 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 and he has this thing he calls graceful extensibility. And, and this, is, this is something when I say we had four things, you know, this agile manifesto, do this and this and this and this is better than what we were doing. Well, this is, this is, the manifesto to trump the agile manifesto to my mind and, and 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 there's a document by this name and it's a pretty it's a pretty difficult read i had to print it out with a marker and mark things and you know because because woods is an academic and he and he's very careful in how he uses language but um what's really important <laughs> is there's a table in about page two or three of this document says, here are the things. And there's 10 of them. And uh, so we're calling S1 to statement one, two, three, four, whatever. And they're organized into uh, kind of categories, managing, managing the risk of saturation. How is it that you make sure that your computer always has enough headroom to keep doing the work that it needs to do? And, and that you and your team have enough headroom to pay attention when you need to pay attention and so forth. And, and what are you gonna do to keep that balance? And he's got three things. I'll just call them S1, two, and three. And, and, and you'll, you'll have to go hunt this up yourself to find out what they are, but they're all about 
managing risk of things getting choked up and full. The, the, the other thing, let's see, I can even magnify this a little bit. There we go. The uh, understanding that you're operating in a network of adaptive units. Units might be people, units might be servers. You know, it, it, it's everything's trying to get along to keep things going. And that adaptive behavior uh, solves some problems and creates problems at a different level. And uh, Woods refers to the uh, tangled layered network. And that, you know, the layers, well, of course there's layers because you have a lot of different layers in a computer, you have a lot of different layers in an organization and they all think they relate this way, but it's tangled because when things are going wrong, there's all kinds of interaction and uh, three more points on that. And, and this is the word I love. All these things have constraints, but part of resilience is in the moment, figuring out some way to outmaneuver whatever constraint is holding you back. And that outmaneuvering is, uh, is, is, is really where humans are exceptional. You know, whatever is going on, you know, I'm thinking, oh, there was that guy who lost the tail of his airplane and he's flying along and he figured out how to fly without a tail and he got everybody home, you know, unhurt. And, you know, on the radio, they say, okay, we've cleared the area. You're free to land on this runway. And he says, what do you think? You think we can make it to a runway? <laughs> you know, we're just going to, we'll land wherever the thing comes down. But, but that was outmaneuvering constraints and being prepared to do that is, is what the woods is all about. Uh, now, I, uh, I want to, I'll get back to this in a minute, but I just wanted to mention this. So this is old school, our stuff, and the next generation. And this is what I think. And, and of course, there's so much going on in computers that, that there'll be other versions of this having to do with big data and, and machine learning and, and stuff like that that uh, are related, but a little different. But this is, this is the big data center stuff. Now, now what I wanna really get at is, uh, what I think is kind of a misunderstanding sometimes of uh, how Agile works when it's at its best. And, and uh, I wanna say that, you know, our computer work, there's a lot of rote work. You know, you've done it before, you gotta do it again. You know, you gotta type those same commands, you know how to check them out. It's predictable and it's manageable. And if you tell your boss you're going to be done in a week, you'll probably be done in a week. You might finish early because you know what you're going to do. And that rote work is not this stuff that Woods is talking about. But, you know, in all of our work, there's what I call unexpected solutions are required where, where you set out to do something and you think you know how to do it and it doesn't work. And you say, no, wait a second, why doesn't this work? What assumption am I making that doesn't apply? How is the computer different or the system of computers different? And, 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 and this isn't just because some power supply went out. This is just be, because we write code that has sufficient levels of behavior that it surprises. Now, managers start getting nervous because they said, gee, you were just clicking things off day after day. And now, now I can't tell what you're doing. Well, you're groping for a new idea. And, you know, it's actually a pretty scary time because uh, you don't know when you're going to find that idea. You're waiting for a light bulb moment and uh, uh, you can't predict when that light bulb moment is going to happen. Uh, but I like to remind people that this is actually the most leveraged thinking you're going to do in your computer career is when when the unexpected solution has to be delivered. And, and this is creative work. And just like, you know, outmaneuvering constraints, how do, how do you overcome the fear that you're not prepared to do the job that you're being asked to do and say, let me just sit here and look around and hope I get an idea. And, 
after that happens, about three years of that, you realize, you know, ideas will come to you. You know, you can do that. Now, this gets into the notion of, uh, I want to mention velocity and technical debt are two things that are, are, are misunderstood. And uh, one is, um, what is good velocity? And if you ask a manager, he says, more velocity is always good. Faster, how can we go faster, faster? And that's not true at all. That there is, you don't wanna go real slow, but you don't wanna go real fast. You wanna find that point where when something pops up, you're prepared to look for the unexpected solution and that you're not trembling while you're doing that saying, oh my God, you know, this was supposed to be done at five o'clock and it's already 4.30, you know, that, 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 that you, can, you can do that. And I wrote a pattern language about this, which was kind of a, a, a leading into what we now call extreme programming and then agile after that, that I called episodes. Because, because I felt that there was, you know, you're working along and then something presents itself. And this is like a new chapter okay, this programming isn't like it was just a half an hour ago. We're on to something new. And, and there's this buildup, you know, you're looking, what is it this? What is it this? And it's kind of like climbing a hill. And this is where you're getting kind of nervous. Will we ever get to the top? But you get to the top and the light bulb goes on. You say, oh my God, I've got it. This is going to work. And it's really a pretty exciting time. And then there's the kind of coming down the hill where now that you've got a solution, you have to put that solution into the code in such a way that when you come back to it a month from now, you can in your mind recreate that state that you spent all that time going up the hill. That's the episode. Recognizing that you've got some hard work in front of you, doing the work, waiting, groping. What is, what is this concept that I'm missing? You find it, and then you have to make that obvious in the code. And, and that is what we'd call a relentless refactoring. You know, the variable names were throwing you off. So you change the variable names. You, you make it clear. You put a function, change a function. This really belongs over there. Because now that we know the answer, we can say that. But we don't know every answer. What we're doing is we're saying, we just did two hours of hard work, and we want to save that hard work in the code because we know we're going to be back here, you know, in three weeks with something that we never anticipated before, but we have to pick it up. So that, that, that getting into it, getting out of it is something. And what you do is you just say, you know, on the average week, this happens two or three times a day, and it usually takes about an hour, and it's pretty scary when it happens, but we're seeing an average rate of production. And the only reason you do this is because people want to know. They can't tell what you're doing, so you have to tell them, well, we're, we're getting this work done at about this rate, and we have every reason to believe that it'll continue uh, at that rate, and that is the right rate. If we try to work faster than that, we won't get the good answers. And if we work slower than that, we'll be a little bored and we'll put a bunch of stuff in there that we don't need. So finding, finding that right. And, and what I'm telling you here is this is a function that the computer programmers can feel when it's right and a manager simply can't tell. So a manager cannot tell you what the right velocity is. You can only tell them when you're doing the best job you can, this is the velocity we see. And with that is this notion of technical debt. And I just wanna say that technical debt is, in my mind, a strategy. How can we work at an, a nice clip and when we find a problem, we find a solution, we say, well, this is really a partial solution. This isn't the whole solution, but it'll allow us to deliver something to our customer this week and then we can learn some more. That is admitting that you haven't found everything, but you found enough that you can put it in front of a customer. And it also means that you have to do this episode right so that you clean things up so that when you do get back into that, you can pick up where you left off. And that is the right velocity. And that is managing the incomplete work as 
things you know you could have done if you took more time, but you didn't because you're racing something to the market and you want to have that interaction with your customer. And, and that is technical debt as a strategy. It's a strategy for optimizing velocity so that you're making the most good decisions every day. Good decisions, not just crazy decisions. And, and that's where we want to really get technical. What does it mean to be good? And so, so here, let me, let me poke at something. This, this is my explanation for a manager where I was telling them that, no, you as a manager don't get to choose velocity. This is where velocity comes from. And, and I coined this phrase normative good. This means that we all agree about what good is. And a manager will say, well, every developer has a different opinion of what good is. And if you let them, they'll just argue, you know, well, yeah, if that's, if that's what you let them do, that's what they'll do. But that's not what a good developer will do because they discuss good with each other. This is, this is a social process where it's easy to do if you're pair programming, you say, you think that's the right answer? Why did you think that's the right answer? Because I thought we were going to go over here. Oh, you did. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I saw that yesterday when I was working with the other guy. You know, this, this socialization of what good is, and good is always dependent upon what you're working in, who you're trying to please, what rate do you need to go, and so forth. There is no universal good. There's just, you know, let's call it fit for purpose. And, and there, there's some process here. So this, is, this basically says this is what we're trying to accomplish. And, and here's how we do it. This is, this is extreme programming. It explains some of the things that you happen. And, and, and how we get a working velocity out of that. This is a little bit of how to, how to code yourself out of incomplete understanding. And, and this came out of object-oriented programming. Well, you know, in every message send, there's kind of an if statement and you kind of set the objects right so you can have it both ways. Oh, this is what we thought it is and this is what we think it will be. And we're just gonna have both in there in the system until we find out what's really right. Uh, um, this is, you know, I wrote this to be read very carefully. So I recommend you take some time and read this sentence by sentence by sentence and figure out what it means. But now we get to the good stuff. Whose job is it to decide what good is? And it's the people with the fingers on the keyboard, the people who are feeling what the code wants to do, what they want to do, or reconciling wants versus needs and all that. And, and this... This is, if you don't do this, if you say, I'm only doing this because my boss said to, I think it's the wrong thing, but I'm doing it. You're shirking your responsibility. You have a responsibility to put good decisions into the code, more consistent good decisions every day, put it in front of customers every week, whatever. And more importantly, it's important that you and your colleagues agree on what good is. This is where test-driven network and pair programming just creates a, decision, a point where you can talk again and again and again about what good is and establish what are, what are really the norms of the project. How, is, how are we going to get this thing done if we're going to work in it for the next 18 months or three years where we're happy on year two and a half as we are now? And that, that, is, that is the key. Now, there's, there's something that happens here, and uh, I was going to, oh, here, let's, let's do this. If I click on this, this is the same thing, process, technique, whatever. What I did is I just rewrote this, and this is what you can do in this wiki because it's federated and I have multiple accounts. And so over here, I said, let's take this apart, what I just said. I believe it. I believe it strongly. It's something that's often misunderstood. I just went and I, I said, let's take it apart, the process, the technique, the responsibility, whatever. And let me line that up with Woods things. Now remember Woods is managing risk of saturation, outmaneuvering constraints, networks of adaptive units. And I'm over here, XP in the norm of good has got this process. And, so, and I started lining up. 
you know, okay, this process, so that's S2 and S3, little S1 in there, but S1 is also responsibility, which was made down here. And, and uh, one of the interesting things is uh, when I was done, I didn't have, you know, Woods has 10 things and I think I only have nine here, you know? And so it was interesting. What, what did Agile leave out of all the things that Woods knew we needed to do? And, and I'm just gonna leave that as an exercise for you to try to figure out, but you know, they're, they're all numbered and, uh, 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 and, it, and, it, and, it, and it'll be something that we simply didn't face when we were doing desktop computing but we do face now. So, so, so there's more. And it is described in a different language, but it's a language worth learning if you're, if you're working at this level. Now, the, uh, the other thing I've done with this is I've used Wood's uh, graceful extensibility. And uh, we had a little checklist. It's more than a checklist, it's a survey. You know, here's 50 things that we just asked. You do this a lot, a little as a team. And we go to all our teams and we, oh, here's so 73 indicators of uh, uh, agile fluency and in our process and so forth. And so uh, what I did, well, I took some of our best engineers and I said, okay, let me explain what Wood says and let me explain what we're asking our engineers and how do they line up? So what I just did there before, I showed how they line up. I just asked people for each indicator and, and here's, here's a list of the indicators. I squeeze it in my narrow column, but if I spread out a little bit, here's, this is 73 different things. Agile teams have one top priority. Well, if you got a team with two top priorities, which do you work on on Monday? You know, all these things, everyone participates in meetings. Potential security incidents reported, blah, you know, well, secure, that's not. Anyway, this is a nice list and it was a little scrambled, but then we sorted it out after we pulled people and then we would discuss the team agrees or doesn't agree on these things. If they don't agree that they do or don't, then that's a conversation. But here I'm lining it up with Wood's 10 thing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And I would ask people, is this thing really about one or two or three or four? This one's mostly about four. You can see the people said this is number four. And, and so what you, you can do is see how well, what we were asking of our engineers, and we would do this annually, how does that compare to what Woods thought was important and where do we have good coverage and where do we don't? This is a good chance to try to figure out what we could do that we're not doing. Uh, I also, I'm calling them S's, there are statements. Uh, they're also sometimes called theorems. By theorem, here, here, here is one person I asked, subject one. He happened to be one of the team health survey assessors. And another one was a reliability engineer and a team, another, you know, another reliability engineer. Uh, so what did I ask, six people here or something. And, and I said, well, how many S1s are there? How many S2s? How many S3s? For, and these are the reminding what all those things are. And, and the cool thing is I can pop this up on a radar chart and see these, these and this is why I say this guy's blue. So over here in blue, this is this, this, this person and so forth. And this, this gives us a, an indication of things that we're good at and things that we're maybe not so good at. As I scroll through this, it sort of that's a little cool thing that you can do if you got JavaScript. Uh, manage the risk. Everybody thought, well, that's what Agile does. It manages the risk. But what about this stuff over here that, are, you know, uh, what is that? S7, uh, two fundamental forms. And gosh, I'm embarrassed that I'm having a little trouble remembering what that is because 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 clearly we don't do a lot of it, you know, and and uh, so this is this is how I've learned by uh, comparing Wood's recommendation to uh, to 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 what we do in practice. Here's a little bit about how we got started on this team structure and so forth. Uh, this a lot of good reading here. And uh, uh, 
it's the kind of things we can really dig into. Now, now I see that the time is, is slipping by. This is, this is the heart of the, what I wanted to do because this is the stuff that really I should be saying at an Agile conference. I do want to mention a little bit about Wiki because uh, I got some more going on in Wiki. And, and you know, the original Wiki, we set out, we said, we want to understand we need a new literature of computer programming, something that it recognizes the kind of challenges that we face every day. And it's not like mathematical proof stuff. It's, it, it's, it's really more like, how do we get through the day? And, and uh, that became a pattern language. Alexander had a real lot of touchy feely stuff in, in, in what he described. So it made sense. It was neat that that worked so well. And in fact, as I walk around offices and I'll hear people talking about what they're gonna do and, and probably, you know, a subject doesn't go through until they, they mention two, maybe three words that were coined in that wiki. You know, it was very active for five years, still pretty active for another five, kind of getting old for another 10 years. Finally, all the, all the brilliant people had moved on and were doing their own blogs and so forth. So it's, it's now frozen, but it's, it, it really had an impact. Of course, the wiki stuff got picked up by the encyclopedia people and, and people freaked out. What do you mean? You know, my high school kid is writing encyclopedia articles. That can't be good. Well, it turns out it was good and, and they try very hard. And so that's pretty amazing what they did. And it's amazing in this time full of misinformation that Wikipedia recognized as the quality source it is. The thing that I wanted to show you is this had a creative element, this less creative, here the creativity is how do we run a process where we don't kill each other and still end up with an article in the end of the day. So that's kind of creative in the process. Here, I'm looking for a way to go back to the wiki that isn't like we're all in one wiki and we have to agree, we all get our own wiki, but there's a process of storytelling that can work there. And, and it's based on the Creative Commons attribution share alike. And, and if we all just put stuff up there and say, you're welcome to take my stuff as your own, but don't forget where you got it. This is, uh, this is what we do. And in fact, this whole site has really been built uh, around that kind of thing. And I say, well, here's something I did. This, this same page I just wrote this morning, you know, is over here. Cause I started over here and I decided I wanted to be here and so forth. So the, the page gets around and I can say, show me that version of the page. And I can go through here and say, well, what, what happened to this page? You know, and so I can, you know, it has all this kind of scrolly stuff. And, and this, is, this is so that you can have a variety of opinions and still make sense of what's going on. And, and uh, I started hitting my back button. Let's see, where did I wanna be? I wanted to be, uh, yeah, I wanted to, here's an example. Let me just tell you an example. Here is something that happened during the pandemic. I started just riding my bicycle around and I didn't have a daily commute. So I just went down dead end streets and I discovered at the end of the, you know, there's no reason to go down a dead end when I'm on the commute, but I go down a dead end and I would find that there's a little trail at the end of the day. And I go down that trail, a dirt trail, you know, the kids cutting through and, and I, I could ride my bike on it. And down at the bottom was a little creek and a bridge across the creek. And I could go up the other side and I could say, well, where the heck am I? And I'd use my phone, I'd take a picture and I got the GPS coordinates and I'd, I'd drawn a map. So here's what the map is looking like now. Now, now I actually have to like target. Well, here's here here here's some trails marked here. Let's go there. And here I mark some trails. Here here I mark some trails. And I haven't been there yet, but this 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 is where I live. I've been. Let's see. It's right down here in the corner. Two hundred and eighty nine trails in a year and a half of pandemic. And what this means. When I, th you know, five years from now, when I think back to the pandemic, I say, oh yeah, I know, I, that's when I really understood what water did as it carved up the terrain where I lived. You know, it's water that makes these trails. 
and, and dead end streets and so forth. 839 images, and, and there'll be more this weekend. But the interesting thing is people were watching me do this and they say, well, gee, I'd like to do that too. So I had some friends in Seattle. So I whipped one up. Let's do this for Seattle. Let's places we visit in Seattle. And, and oops, not from there. We're not going to see it. But anyway, uh, then, then a friend of mine said, well, I'd like to do this with seventh graders as a different kind of writing. So so he, num he named it photo telling and we wrote a vision and what does it mean? A place experience. It's, it's not it's not that I got there and I rode this trail and I came home. It was while I was riding the trail. It was it was an episode. Remember I was talking about it has a beginning and then I get down to the creek and do I turn around or keep going? And I decide to keep going and I get to the other side and now I'm someplace else. And, and, and it's an episode. And, and by the way, that's what I was drawing here. I was drawing episodes. Here's where I took a picture and another picture, another picture. Here's where I intend to go are these blue things, but the red things are all the episodes that I've had for a year and a half, usually following along some trail or something. Sometimes I just find something that's not even on the map. So this is, this is pretty important. Here we're talking about how to set this up as, a, as an assignment for uh, seventh graders. So I said, oh, okay, well, just do a, do a, do a experience your block by uh, looking at the houses and taking a picture of the main entrances. And then I pulled up a little, this is uh, Chris Alexander talking about how important the entrance to a house is and transitions. And so, so here I'm elevating, I say right there in your own street, you have some interesting stuff going on and, and, and why not pull that up? And if I pop over here to this site where I actually have the images, here's where I, here's where I did some examples. I said, here's an example of my street. And this is, this, there's a little workflow here that you can upload some pictures and then get this little map and it reads the XIF and you write a little bit about the, there's my doorway. You know, but this was neat. There's these people had this, you know, we in our neighborhood, we have a lot of uh, uh, front porch uh, gathering spaces. And once they did it, it was so much fun that we end up having a little place in our front porch too. So, uh, and here's the next street over is a little different. Um, and and this, is, this is a wiki that now has a process model and we can apply that process model to, to do work. Now, maybe just documenting doorways isn't very complicated but work, but here we're thinking about how that could go beyond that. And, and, and this is, this, oh, let's see, I, I'm, 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 I think I'm right on time. Uh, this is, am I right on time? No, I used all my time. Oh, darn. Uh, it's, it's just so fascinating seeing you, uh, you know, show through the wiki and, you know, just shows how uh, passionate you are about this whole thing. And, you know, that's amazing. Uh, 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 all amazing. right. So I think I can stop here. But if you go look this up, this is pretty interesting. This is what is evolving as a way to program this stuff that, not surprisingly, is simple. And I want to make a pitch. I'd hope to make that pitch, but I made too many other pitches. At this point, I think that I would be pleased. Do we have time for one question? What's the best question that people have been asking? Uh, so I have uh, one question. Uh, oh, he says, when are you going to shut up? Because <laughs> no. <laughs> I think everyone's just so enamored and uh, kind of just lost with you in, in, in uh, going through. Oh, well, good, because that's what I want to do. And I was a little lost too, but it... Uh, that, that there's passion there, let's say, and there's as much passion as there ever was. And computers are more interesting than they've ever been, the damn things. Absolutely, and that was that was very evident from, uh, from your talk. So that was pretty awesome. I have one question here from Narayan for you, and then maybe we will take the remaining questions, uh, you know, uh, at the Hangout. So yep. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, read out Narayan's question. It's a little long, so I'll try and pause. So with, uh, with respect to waiting for ideas to basically come, right? Uh, Narayan says, with all due respect to the theory, uh, this is what I have learned. 
uh, waiting for ideas is probably not optimal. Uh, doing something instead with uh, what you do and have, uh, which produces mistakes and leads to learning, uh, is how he believes instead of waiting for ideas is probably a better way and wants to know what are your thoughts. I, I agree completely. And, and if I say waiting for an idea, you know, if you got a computer, you're going to sit there and poke at things or type things or Google things or uh, if you're working together, well, how did you ever, did you ever see this before? No, I never saw. Oh, then it's not just me. We're both stumped. Oh, what a relief. It's not just me. But whatever you do, uh, when you're successful, take a moment and think about it and figure out how to do more of that. And, and there, there is a saying that, uh, you know, good luck comes to the prepared mind. You know, this is, this is what really being a professional is, is being consciously curious about everything that happens in the work you do and how it might be better or faster or more thoroughly understood. And, and that's, that's actually a very personal thing. But when you have the experience of the computer with somebody sitting right next to you, this pair programming, then you could say, remember when we did this, then what happened? And then, then, then that's when you put words to that experience and that will be with you for a long time. So, so yeah, you, 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 you don't turn your mind off and go to sleep, although sometimes that helps. But uh, no, you, you're, you're, you, 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 you stop and you say, whatever I thought I'm doing is not what I'm doing. I have to do something else. And, and experience has shown, here's some things that work for me. Yes, okay. thank you for that question. It's a good clarification. All right, awesome. Uh, just want to add on to that is uh, one of the phrases that I've often heard and used myself is action precedes clarity. Uh, and sometimes I think just, you know, uh, starting to play around and doing things uh, kind of helps you reinforce or, or uh, uh, you know, basically understand what is going on a little better before you can make a decision or jump to a conclusion. So there's this guy, Friston, who's developed that to an algebra. And he talks about all living things probe to learn. You have this model of what's going on. It doesn't match with reality. You reach in and touch something. And, and that tests your theory against what's there. Uh, Carl Friston is, uh, you know, if you really want to read some Bayesian something or other, this, that, and the other. But it's, 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 it's the good stuff in that. That explains why it works. Wiki is so much like that, right? You have an idea, you put it out there, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a way to probe the world and see what other people feel. And I, I think that that's such a powerful uh, way of collaboration. So again, just wanted to thank you for creating the Wiki and everything else you've done. A fantastic session as you're, well. You're welcome. So all you guys have to do is be creative to repay me. <laughs> all right. Do something wonderful. Yes, absolutely. All right. We'll see, we'll see you around. Thanks so yeah, much. Thank for the all right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.